Senate Bill Number 472 SD1 establishes possession of marijuana of one ounce or less as a civil violation that is subject to a fine of $1,000 and that the direct civil fines and penalties for violations be deposited by the State Director of Finance to the credit of the State General Fund. Introduced by Ms. Willie, waived GREDC. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve Resolution 81-13? So moved. Moved by Ms. Willie, second by Ms. Ford. Um, would you like me to call? Um, but would you like me to call anyone to the table first, or would you just like to open discussion? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Ms. Willie. Okay. Um, in my opinion, too often local governments avoid controversial issues, especially if being addressed on another government level. So I want to be clear that it's my intent as here to bring forward this issue or others to the council, controversial matters that are important to the people on this island so that we can discuss them in an adult way as problem solvers, in particular, whereas here there are competing legitimate interests, and I want to underline that word, legitimate concerns and interests. Right now, this issue is being debated in Honolulu with an, isle, an ocean between us. I want things to be discussed here so that we act more proactively and review these issues. I also want to focus that what I'm talking about here, or what I see this issue, is one of what is the appropriate punishment. I am not here to discuss whether we legalize marijuana or not. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, I think that what is clear from the discussion and from the testimony and from the emails I've received is the fear that decriminalizing will is a slippery slope towards legalizing. And I, I do appreciate that. But at the same time, I want to focus, and I want to focus the discussion that what is the appropriate punishment? That's what we're here to discuss. I also just... Um, appreciate all of the um, testimony of everyone and especially the youth coming forward and expressing their concerns. This is about your lives. These drugs do affect you and those around you in a very important way and it's your future that we're talking about. Um, in terms of punishment, I, I just want to say from some of my concerns on the other side are is, is it important to stop lumping marijuana with meth and heroin? Is it, for me, at least when I was, you know, in the 60s, 70s, the sort of looking at marijuana and heroin and methamphetamine is sort of one lump, that those were sort of, these are the bad things. Alcohol's fine, these are what's bad. Um, and so that's a concern of mine, that those who use marijuana are more likely to try and use hard drugs because it sort of puts it as all uh, sort of a criminal activity. So in that mind, I'm looking at does, the question is, does moving this over to a civil uh, fine somewhat separate those and recognize that not that marijuana use is, is good, but that how do we punish it and how do we separate it out from um, something along the lines of meth and heroin, which are so devastating in their addictiveness. Um, I also see people that I have known who now have criminal records for small amounts of marijuana that has really um, harmed their life and their future. And we can say, okay, we're not, uh, you know, the police office, even if they could arrest someone for these amounts, they're not doing it. Um, but let me just say, as a lawyer, I'm, I'm really into the rule of law. I like laws to be obeyed. I like it that if we don't like them, that we change them. We don't just ignore them. Um, I also am concerned the amount of funds of arrests and prosecution for small amounts. And just the whole, uh, there's an attitude and a, an approach of a government towards its people and that we mean what we say and we say what we mean. So. 
Let me also say that in my family, just to add a little personal, it's really alcohol that's been devastating and um, in its impact and not um, those who have used marijuana. I don't use marijuana, but there are a number of people in my family that have. And finally, I want to say that um, I am have experience with the uh, the sale or the use of medical one and in California, in San Jose, um, one of my daughters has Lyme disease and was very great pain, just wanted to die, and did had never didn't like drugs. But finally, it became clear. We found that the only thing that worked was for her nerve pain was um, marijuana. Now, again, I want to separate out that we do have a program for medical marijuana. That that's not at issue. But I think all, all of these things get crowded. Um, I do. I, I expect that I'm going to withdraw this motion, but I feel it's this discussion or this um, resolution. But I think this is important beginning discussion and how we look at things. And the only thing I again ask other council members to focus on the question of what is the appropriate punishment, mm -hmm. not what you all think we sh think should be done in terms of um, uh, legalization. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Willie. Um, Ms. Poindexter. Okay, when um, you ask that we not focus on the legalization, but in your resolution, you have a whereas in 2012 voters of Colorado, and you reference the legal, uh, uh, the first state to legalize and regulate the production, possession, and distribution of marijuana for persons age 21 and older. So that opens up the discussion for legalization of marijuana. So with that said, um, I I'd like to call Dr. Wasan. I have some questions for you. Could you come up to the table? Can you just identify yourself for the record? I'm Dr. Jamal Wasan. Okay. Um, can you get yeah the microphone enough? And if you, can, I can ask you to. Um, is the microphone on? The light, the big, yeah. Bright green will light up. Oh, there it is now. Okay, good. Go. And I'd like to ask you to just speak slowly so we can all understand because I know sometimes when you were timed during the three minutes, everybody tries to rush to get everything in on three minutes and we kind of miss things. And this is really important to me. You said something about um, affecting the cognitive thinking. So what I'd like to know is how how does it affect the cognitive? What does it do to the brain like other substances? How does, what makes that happen? And then, and then go into how, you talked about the, something about maybe an IQ level dropping. Um, so can you explain that please? How does, how does it, how a person get addicted to marijuana? Or what does it affect, how does it affect the brain? Okay, uh, and I will try to speak slow. I'm, I'm originally from New Jersey and back there we speak fast. But, but I've been here since 1993, so I should be able to speak, you know, slow enough. Um, first of all, uh, the, we, we've always known uh, in science, you know, and I heard uh, some gentlemen before were saying that that doesn't sound like, like real science. I think that's our problem. We want to ignore real science and come with their opinion, and I think it's time for us to stop doing that and, and just speak about what the science is actually saying. Uh, the science and just anyone who's ever used Pacololo, and I have smoked Pacololo, okay, so uh, I don't anymore, obviously, but I have. And you know the reason why you're smoking Pacololo is because of the effect. And the effect is to help you to feel more relaxed. And then some people, they want to go further than that. They want to get real stoned, so which has a slightly mild hallucinogenic effect. When it comes to the IQ, the frontal lobe, or we call it uh, the singular interior, the interior singular cortex, which is a frontal lobe, which is the part where we think with, okay? This is what makes us so unique, is this part of our brain up here. This part of our brain back here is called reptilian or hindbrain. That just controls involuntary actions and all those issues, like blood pressure and all that. And we have the midbrain or limbic system, which controls our emotional. It is a neocortex is what we think with, okay? So we talk about intellect or IQ. That's what's being impacted. We look at a child, an adolescent, the ages of 13, the brain doesn't stop developing until around 24, 25 now, we're saying. So a study was done 
And the study was done in New Zealand. Over a thousand something uh, people from the age of 13, they began, and they finished at the age of 38. So we're talking about a longitudinal study, okay, that went on for 25 years under controlled circumstances. And what they found was that there was an 8% to 10, 8 to 10 percent, but they hold it 8, an 8 percent drop in the IQ, because that part of the brain that is being developed is being, the, the interior cingular cortex is actually being impacted by the marijuana. It is actually going to that part of the brain, affecting them. So the drop. Now this is significant, because you need to understand that we have, uh, people here are lawyers. If, if you may have had, you know, lawyers are, are really, um, and, and most professionals, IQs are, are called very bright, you know, 110 or higher. You take away those 10 points or 8 points, then you're down to 1 or 2. You're not as bright as you were. And, you, and it, the study also shows you do not recover. So if you were doing at least 3 days a week of marijuana from age of 13 all up to 25, and this study went to 38, then you might not be lawyers sitting in this room right now. So we're looking We're looking at... We're, we're, Can you just say that again? Because you're, you're I, 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 sped, I sped up again? Okay. If you were dropping the 8 points, dropping from being very bright down to just being average or low average, you might not be sitting in this room. You might have been able to pass that LSAT, do some of those studies you're able to do and concentrate and focus. So that's what our part of the concern is. We're half cake and we have these adolescents and stay that we're hoping will grow up to become leaders in the state of Hawaii and like Obama, maybe even president. But if you're constantly doing this, and that's that's the problem, they're not casual users because that's not what we're pushing with our children. Because we're saying that it's really not a serious drug. And, and I have to disagree. You know, um, all these other hard drugs, for example, that we're talking about here, it's only tobacco that kills half a million people a year. So you can drop ice and hair and all that off, off the map you want to get about which is the run that's really killing everybody is cigarettes. So it's not about the impact that it's doing on the society as a whole, it's what it's doing for the individual. And when you talk about cigarettes, does I read somewhere that um, marijuana has 60% more cancer-causing agents than cigarettes. Is that well? Tr- we, we, we know it has 60 uh, identifying different chemicals that are actually within marijuana that are not in cigarettes. And we do know that if they were smoking, the studies have not been because remember I just said there's only been like 20 or so clinical trials. And we're talking about like 300 people or so that did some actual studies on this. So the preliminary Preliminary respiratory disease or illnesses, they say that there is a link there, they're seeing it, but they just haven't smoked enough. They don't smoke three packs a day. Okay. But once you do that, so it's the delivery system that is a problem. Now, and also let's be clear, I am not against um, um, marijuana or, or tetrahydrocannabinol, that's what the, the chemical we're talking about, being used to treat uh, people with Lyme disease or neuropathic uh, problems or, or for anorexia, which helps them to eat or cancer. So it's not the problem. What we're talking about, and this is what the AMA is saying, you know, not for the smoking marijuana stuff. They're saying we should have a control study, move it off of Schedule 1, which includes heroin, LSD, and peyote, move it off of that schedule so that they can do real testing on it because it's illegal to do so. And therefore, they can define and, pre- and prescribe medication which has tetracanabal on it, like Marinol. And Canada has one called Severtec, which they're using now for a spray, which is a, qu- a quick delivery system, so that we'll stop smoking it. That is a poor way to get marijuana into a system because it has other health risks. It does, however, it does help for AIDS victims and anorexia and cancer and all that. So um, there's no issue with that. It's just there's a way to do that without getting the high and also being able to concentrate on getting uh, the effects that we really wanted, the medical effects we really want to. Thank you. Do you have a question? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Logan. This is such a controversial issue. And as I thought about it and thought about it, I go back to my core values, and that's integrity first, remember the people, and excellence with aloha. And first, what are we really doing? Right now, as a council, we're debating and we're discussing this resolution. And this resolution, if it passes, it's saying that 
We support Senate Bill number 472 that um, Senator Russell Ruderman is advocating for in the state. So what I'm hearing from the testimonies is I hear legalization, I hear criminalization, and I hear medical. Now the difference between the three, legalization is it's legal within the state. Criminalization is it doesn't become a criminal punishment, so it's a civil punishment. And medical is it's used for a disease or some cause of illness. Now I thought about it. So currently what is our state criminal offense for marijuana? And as I went through some of the um, government websites and also some of the pro-marijuana websites and anti-marijuana websites, right now marijuana you are in max fine $1,000, 30 days incarceration, and a misdemeanor fine, a misdemeanor. So looking at it, what will happen if a person get a misdemeanor? And what will happen if a person get a fel felony? And as I research more and more, person who has a felony will be restrictive of some rights, which is the right to vote, the right to be in a jury, and the right to actually enlist in the military. I myself was in the military. And do I want to give someone a felony crime for taking marijuana under an ounce? And as I look at it, do I want someone, an individual, to lose their right to vote, lose their right to participate in government, and lose their right to serve their country? And um, right now, according to our laws, it's not a felony. So if you get busted under an ounce, it's a misdemeanor. So they don't lose that right. So as I look it over, what really changed if Senate Bill number 472 become enacted? The difference is the 30-day incarceration. So why do we actually have a 30-day incarceration? It's to make it severe. It's to make it... Um, make it a deterrence. And as I look at what a deterrence is, the severity, one thing that must comply is the our police officers must enforce the law. And right now we, as a county, have passed this low priority ordinance. And the low priority ordinance, the voters approved it in 2008, 34,957 to 25,464, but that's 2008. A lot of things can happen in four years. Look at the council, six new elected officials. That's a dramatic change. So is it the same mindset? Because it goes back to my core values. I got to remember the people. I got to remember why I'm here. And so I'm thinking it over, and I think about my sister. I think about what kind of message do I want to tell my little sister? And I tell her, don't smoke. Don't do it. Whatever you do, don't do it. But I know her. She doesn't listen to me. When she's 18, she's going to do what she wants to do. And right now, I know that... It's not, I know she's not going to lose her right to vote, lose her right to participate, and lose her right to be in the military. What we really need to do is spend time with our families and make sure that we keep our families away from marijuana and criminalize meth, criminalize ice, crack. So I have a tough decision to make and Right now, I'm trying to keep true to my core values, and that's integrity first, remember the people, and excellence with aloha. I just want the public to understand that this is where I'm coming from.
Thank you, Mr. Logon. I'm going to go to Ms. Ford. Thank you. I've got some questions for several people. Um, doctor, just for the record again, would you state what your PhD is in? My PhD is in health psychology. Okay. Um, a little later on, I'm going to go into my, my personal history. Not with drugs, because I don't have any personal history with drugs. Um, but I, my youngest daughter is working on her PhD in psychology, and she specializes in teenagers with addictions. That's her specialty, and she's pretty highly placed in the state of California for that. She doesn't run anything that, like you do. Um, but one of the things that she has told me um, is that when you're dealing with teenagers, the 13 to, well, up to 25, you say, the brain, the frontal uh, lobe is developing. One of the things that she has been adamant about, and she's against smoking pot, especially by teenagers, and this bill is not about teenagers, but all of this has relevance to this issue. She has told me that between the ages of 13 and 25, that's the time of your life when your, the frontal lobes are developing, and you're developing, hold on, the ability to use logic and to control impulses and to determine long-term consequences of your potential action. And what she's advising me is that when you smoke pot, I'm not talking once in your life, but you know, on a regular basis, that those circuits don't wire properly and you have a case basically of arrested development. Right. You're forever 13. Now, how many of us want to be walking around the planet with the mind of a 13? year old. I mean, it's great when you're 13, but it isn't great when you're 40 or 20 or something like that. Doctor, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, we, talk, we call that fixation. And what happens in the adolescent uh, uh, period of time, you know, they go through our social development stage. We call ego identity versus role confusion. Okay. That's where the learning Please judgment. Please speak slowly. Okay. Uh, uh, they're going through what is called ego identity versus role confusion during that time period. That's where they're trying to figure out what is really what's right and what's wrong. They're really trying to get their values locked in, like you were saying. And and they can't do it very well if the part of the brain that actually handles that is not being wired correctly, is being blocked. So therefore, they're fixated at the point of where they were in the judgment at 13 or 14, and they don't get to be fully functioning adults. See, you know, now, now we know this because you can't rent a car until you're age 25. They already knew that because their brain wasn't fully developed correctly. That's why the rent car rental company, they were ahead of everybody else. They knew it, so they're not going to rent you the car. So if we understand that, and we place a man on the back in the contest with the drug, and we're saying that we're purposely stopping those connections, those neurons, from connecting correctly in the anterior singular cortex where the judgment is being formed, then you've just, you just screwed them up. So we're not just talking now about intelligence, whether they're able to be bright or not. We're now talking about being able to make correct decisions based on having had that part of our brain that's being wired has been able to take and synthesize those into judgment that makes sense and makes logic. You know, illegal, immoral, and irresponsible are certain values. If it's illegal, immoral, irresponsible, I'm not going to do it. What if your brain is wired so that, hey, I don't think that this is immoral, or I don't think this is irresponsible, so then your behaviors want to match what your thoughts are. And we got we got to really grasp that. All behavior serves a purpose. So if my brain is not wired to say that this is wrong, then my purpose for doing this smoking or acting certain behaviors is really okay. And it's you people that are screwed up. It's not me. And they don't get it. They don't get it. And that's scary. Okay. Thank you. And the gentleman in the orange, I don't remember you. Stay there. I'm sure other people have questions. Sir, would you come on up? Um, I believe that you testified your work with 12-step programs. Yeah. Okay. Please have a seat. I want you to reintroduce yourself and explain the type of 12-step programs. And just name the programs that you work with. Yes. Um, my name is John Gallagher. And I, I just want to... I only had three minutes, so I'm not even sure what I said. Um, <laughs> okay. But, hold on, sir. I would love to let you go, but they're timing me. No, you're not timing. You go ahead. Okay, thank you. <laughs>
Um, but I just want, I, I'm at, I've been in a 12-step program, Narcotics Anonymous, for 25 years, and I have 25 years clean from all drugs. But I, I want to also emphasize that I'm not representing Narcotics Anonymous. And everything I say here right now is my personal opinion, okay. working with addicts for 25 years, because okay. that's been my spiritual path. Okay, and that's good. Now, I would like you to explain to the council, from your perspective as working in NA, that's Narcotics Anonymous, what it's like dealing with teenagers who are on um, marijuana, that they've been habituated to marijuana. What are they like to work within a 12-step program? Um, well, right now here in Kona, we have a young people's meeting. Get closer to the I'll mic. Get closer. We have a young people's meeting. It's once a week. Uh, you have to be really a teenager to go to this meeting, but some of us members go and speak our experience, you know, to them. Um, all of them, all of them have started with alcohol or pot. That was their first drug of choice. As in, like, my whole fellowship, over 90%. Those are what we. Those are the first drugs we used, and it progressed. Um, they they are fighting. They are fighting to not use from peer pressure, from already letting it in. Because not everybody that drinks is an alcoholic, and not everybody that uses drugs is. Some people can smoke pot a little bit, but there's some of us that can't. It triggers something in our front or in our lobe that all of a sudden changes us. Like ah. Oh, I found it. I can deal with my family. I can deal with school. I, and these young people, to hear their stories and how far behind they are than their peers and falling backwards and then all of a sudden not want to get high and they get high anyhow where they lose that control. That's the part that kills me inside. Um, I, so okay. I'll, I'm going to try to make them short so I can get lots of questions. Okay. Because <laughs> I really love my my friend here when he 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 said crack and heroin and cocaine. You know, ooh, let's outlaw those, but pot. Right. And I'm here to tell you that THC is a very very powerful drug, and it absolutely alters our state. One, I I deal with addicts that use no drug but marijuana, and they they come to me and they and I work with them and they fight for, for freedom of it. Not everybody who smokes is going to happen, but it does happen. And like the doctor said, I don't deal with silence. I deal in the trenches. I deal in the back alleys like the cops do when I go make a 12-step call because somebody's dying of a drug overdose. And, and they're carrying a whole bunch of weed because they're selling their weed to get the drug that they've progressed to because it is absolutely progressive. Okay. We know that without a doubt. All right, thank you. Doctor, I have another question for you. I believe you said that you would like to see marijuana reduced from a Schedule 1 at the federal level to a Schedule 3 so the studies could be done, right? Exactly. Okay. And, and that's what the AMA wants to. Okay, that's fine. Um, I'm going to ask our, one of our, either one of your our captains or both if you would like to come up and we'd like to talk to you, but I, I would like to talk to you a little bit about this. Can I ask you, gentlemen, just to step back to the front row? You'll probably get called again. Okay, while the, while the uh, uh, captains are sitting down, um, we, the three of us, uh, among many other people in Kona, work with Neighborhood Watch, and we, we've we had crime sprees periodically. Fortunately, the last one got busted up again. And um, it's always about the, the drugs. But um, I want to—I don't want to get into hard drugs so much. I want to stay with the marijuana. So from the police perspective, when you get um, a person who maybe just uses marijuana, um, we all know the basic symptoms. You know, they want to get stoned. They, you know, they get the um, the munchies and they want to eat everything inside. And they do all these things. Those are the innocuous things. Um, please explain from your perspective the not so good stuff that you see, and whether or not marijuana is being used solely or in combination with other things. Um, socially, and I'm going to go into socially, and I, I, I try and keep some specifics out, but uh, your, your regular, say, a teenage user, um, and let's go, I know this is not part of the bill, but dispensaries, 
And this is what we see. Um, say a dispensary in downtown corner. Uh, it becomes easy, they're selling. What, what we start to see, and we have seen this, and it hasn't happened in corner, I'm using it because this is not what I'm talking about, is that you have the kids and it draws the attention of these kids who just want to come in and smoke a joint. Sounds harmless enough, but we've seen that, that harmless smoking of a joint turn into harassing of the homeless and eventually turning into robbing other people and just general mischief, if that's what you're talking about at the lowest levels. Uh, from the patrol level, what we mostly see when it comes to marijuana arrests at, at the misdemeanor level is, is they're usually arrested for something else and they actually have the marijuana in their pocket. So a lot of times what you'll see incarcerated, you'll see this big number of uh, marijuana um, pe people incarcerated for marijuana, not mentioning those other cases, be it hard drugs, be it robbery, be it sexual assaults. Marijuana is always on their person. Um, from my years in investigative section, you're looking at 95% of the time every search warrant served, there was some type of marijuana there. Uh, and, and again, you didn't, didn't want to get into hard drugs. The Hawaii Police Department, our main, our main priority is ICE. That's the most dangerous drug in our community now with prescription drug abuse on a, sec, you know, a close second. Um, I hope I'm answering your question, but... Thank you. You yeah. are. Thank you. Uh, that's, just, that's just one of the issues. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Captain Sherlock. Captain Bosky, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I just wanted to add that um, with, with uh, marijuana arrests, those come along with as a, as a side you know, a side crime um, in addition to a hard drug okay. or whether it be um, abuse or, or what, whatever gamut that we um, come in contact with our citizens with. But um, again, most of the marijuana, I would say a good high percentage of the marijuana arrest is is um, in conjunction with something else. Associated with some other drug yes. arrest of some type. Okay, thank you. Um, gentlemen, don't go far. Would you just step back? And Mr. Ishida, I'm going to ask you to come up here for a second. Uh, Mr. Ishida, I'll uh, give you a little pre-warning. We, we put the lowest priority on the ballot that was a, uh, initiated by the public. It passed um, the voters, and I thought it had been overturned by the court, I and mean, I could be wrong. Could you tell us what the status is right now? The uh, county's lowest law enforcement um, priority initiative, which um, became an ordinance after, um, I believe, uh, 2010, 2010, 2010 yeah. election was invalidated by the um, circuit court in Hilo as being violative of both state and federal preemption, what well, was preempted by both federal and state law. My understanding is uh, on appeal, the, um, the advocates of the uh, lowest law enforcement priority then uh, appealed the circuit court's decision and my understanding and recollection my recollection is that the intermediate court of appeals agreed that with the circuit court that the ordinance was preempted in other words it's not only unenforceable it's well, Lincoln, can you speak i can't hear yeah you got to talk up lincoln okay it's um the Intermediate Court of Appeals agreed with Judge Nakamura, the Circuit Court Judge, that both federal and state law um, preempts the um, enforcement of the lowest law enforcement uh, of cannabis ordinance. And uh, that basically ended, the, ended that. I thought that there had been, um, the court had, um, extended leave and allowed the parties to um, somehow, you know, I'd, I'd ask um, Mike Dudovic in our office who was shepherding that case, you know, is this dead? Is it, is it, you know, dead, completely dead? And he said, no, I think the court had allowed them to either, um, perhaps it was to um, 
file another um, request to have the case then removed from the ICA to the Supreme Court. I think Mr. Shimoto knows what I'm talking about. I'm not certain whether that certiorari was granted by the Supreme Court or not, but um, I can check. You know, I can okay. check right now. But uh, basically, I, I don't, uh, basically, essentially, what we had advised the council, the former council at the time that that decision was made to put it to the voters uh, had come to pass that you know that um, irrespective of good intentions or how you try to wordsmith it to get it passed onto the ballot to in front of the voters the federal and state preemption was was fairly clear back then and, and judge nakamura essentially agreed with the county's or at least our position all right thank you mr ishida all right i would like to make a uh, just a comment um so the public understands where i'm coming from i am supportive of medical marijuana i have never questioned the need for that whether the delivery system is correct or not is way out of my ballpark um, I am concerned about this particular resolution. What I would personally like to see is a resolution from this council to the Congress of the United States asking them to pull marijuana off of Schedule 1 and put it on Schedule 3. I think that's the appropriate way to handle this. We are hitting a roadblock at the state level for a multitude of reasons. Some I think are very legitimate and I think some are kind of mm, um, I'm not so sure about. It's not that I want to advocate for decriminalizing or legalizing marijuana just out in the public. But I do think um, as a country we need to treat this differently on Schedule 1 versus Schedule 3. That doesn't resolve the problem that we've got here. Um, I do agree that if we support this bill as it is written at the state, um, first of all, I don't think it's going to stand up based on this lowest priority thing. Um, and I don't even know why the medical marijuana is being allowed. But you decided to time me. Shame on you. But anyway, um, I don't want to see um, this get into the hands of our teenagers more than it is. And while this is strictly about adults, 21 plus, even at 21, people's brains are still wiring those circuits together, and that's a problem. I've never supported drinking at 18. For, I don't know if that causes circuit damage, but um, I still have the same concerns about that. So um, I'm not going to be supporting this as it is written today. Um, I would be interested in seeing something come forward to go to the U.S. Congress to ask it come from the Schedule 1 to Schedule 3 supporting the AMA. But um, today I'm not going to do this, even though I support medical marijuana. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Um, are there additional comments from council members at this time? Ms. Willie? Um, could I have one of the officers come forward? And by the way, um, I can come back to council members. We are implementing the five minute rule, but then you can have a second time too. Okay. Um, I think we've also been reducing the time where other people have brought people forward rather than five minutes. Yes, the, the timer whole, stops um, when the speaker yeah. is, is speaking. Um, just in terms of punishment with alcohol or DUIs, we've sort of gone towards uh, community service and required counseling. And um, that's actually the direction, just with my limited knowledge, and I recognize that it, it, I do have limited knowledge in this area, would think that we might be more effective in terms of uh, marijuana. Um, where we're looking at what are these social ills and that people are uneducated and unaware of the impact that it has on them um, and uh, that they become less productive members of the community and uh, do things. I, I just want to underscore some of what um, Council Member uh, Gregor Illigan spoke about and sort of dividing up. The, it's not sort of one question, are you pro or are you con? It's a complex issue. And I do also support what Ms. Ford said in terms of um, let's try to look at some of these issues and not lump marijuana with the hard drugs. I, I, I don't believe they should and I do feel that that putting them in the same category has a major impact on moving that, having it be a gateway use. Um, and, uh, 
So I just want to, looking at the punishments, what we have for alcohol, alcohol we haven't really discussed, but it is something, at least in my view, and certainly Sharon Vitusik's view, who spoke yesterday, is extremely harmful and causes a lot of fatalities and, and a lot of uh, alcohol. So I'm looking at punishments. We have criminal punishments, we have civil punishments, but also and maybe you call it um, service punishments and and required. I would love to have some of these people that are on it go speak to some of these people as a requirement more than how much they pay or what's on their record. So I just would appreciate if you have any comments on that or um, <laughs> sort of looking at that those alcohol, where we feel we're making more progress in terms of alcohol doing those punishments rather than putting fining people or other types of uh, punishment. Push. Apologize. Well, I apologize. Um, as we like to speak, um, we're kind of, we like to use this thing, weed and seed. And we're, as a police department, we're on, more on the enforcing of the laws. Um, as to what the punishments are or how they come out, I really can't elaborate on that. That would be a whole different side of our, our system. Um, but as a police department, we're all for not seeing guys coming through the, the revolving door of being arrested. Um, if, if you're asking about what the punishments are and how they're changed, I can't really speak on that as I'm not part of the judicial system. I apologize. Okay. Well, um, if that's, uh, you can't speak on it or don't feel comfortable speaking on it, that's, that's, uh, I, I, I understand. Okay, perhaps, can I move you on just speaking to um, Dr., your, can you come forward again for a minute? Um, yes. Can you comment on what I'm just saying? And how, would it be useful to encourage punishment where it's uh, community service oriented and involvement with other groups, youth groups, or counseling so that people become more educated and more aware of alternatives and, and potential long-term impacts of... Well, I, th I think, you know, education is a key and I do know that when they do go to the court system, the judges that I've actually witnessed um, do send, regardless of what the drug is, whether it's marijuana or alcohol or meth, uh, they are referred for assessments. And, and, and treatment, okay. Um, part of the issue with our adolescents that we run into is that uh, they are down at lower levels. You usually go to something called teen court where they're told, hey, you smoked marijuana on campus, you did this, and here's what we're saying you should do. You need to go in for, for assessment and treatment or, or treatment, which is great because I didn't say this, but according to their American um, um, uh, standards for, for uh, addiction medicine, that for adolescents, we usually put them at not at a dependent level of treatment, but at a prevention awareness level of treatment, and it's called ASEM level uh, 0 0.05. Okay, and the, and the, if we could do more of that, if we get to the adults or those who are actually you know strong violence of the law, they're typically not coming in as awareness; they're coming in as actual treatment because of the fact that they've reached the stage of not just reasoning, which is earlier than that, but they're at the stage as adults where they are actually influencing these children. So we therefore give them treatment. Typically they're given treatment. And I think we should continue to do that. Okay. And let me say I'm going to withdraw this resolution. But um, if someone still has another comment before I do so, I um, that would be fine with me. But then come back. Could, could I say something to the council, um, council, council member? You know, when you said the military, um, for me, uh, you really hit something. You queued up on me, and I, and I was taken aback for a second. That's not about the federal issue. I was a Marine in Vietnam at 19. I was wounded twice in action. I was actually flown back in the hospital and got out. But I got involved with drugs, specifically marijuana, 
because it helped to numb my feelings. What it also did, though, it stopped me from being able to advance and become, become you know, go to college or anything. It wasn't until I was able to, and it wasn't, my drug wasn't the other drugs, although I was addicted to opioids, but that's what the hospital gave me for my pain, my shrapnel wounds. But it was the marijuana that was blocking my education. And when I stopped that, and that's why, and, and I was only 21 when I got out of the hospital, I need to be real clear that we need to help the youth. And I really am speaking for the youth from my heart. We need to help the youth not have to go through some of those things that I had to go through when I did use marijuana to stuff my feelings and wasn't able to concentrate or focus or do anything. Thank you. Would you like to respond, Mr. Logan? I just wanted to say something short. Um, yes, we do need to help the youth. And right. Right. thank you for serving. Thank you. Ms. Poindexter. Yeah, I'd just like to say yesterday we had that um, a presentation by Dr. Vatusik, and she did say, you know, um, what we need to uh, start st uh, looking at is the data on how many people are in accidents that are on marijuana mm. that are causing even deaths on our road mm. because it alters, uh, the, you know, the, um, the brain. But she was also saying, you know, it's hard for the police to be called off, off their beat to come and just sit and wait at the hospital in emergency rooms to kind of try to collect that data. We need more police officers. So we need to start looking at, you know, a, a lot of the things are not documented, but the drugs like alcohol on the roads are killing our people and killing our children. I know that for a fact. And um, I just want to say, too, that... Um, I, I do support medical marijuana, however, I will support it once we can regulate the doses because THC, like you said, in Hawaii, and they've done these studies, we have the THC here level compared to other mm -hmm. states. Hawaii, for some reason, is off the charts and very dangerous if you give, say, my daughter who is neurologically impaired, somebody gives her that, you could kill her, you know, and she wouldn't know the difference because she's a special needs child. That would be so dangerous out there. So if we pass this bill, our public health and safety consequences will be disastrous for this state. Thank what, you. what you're saying is that it causes, it does cause a psychiatric break, a psychotic break in some people. People, but marijuana you know, not that benign. That's what you're sharing. It, it does cause psychiatric breaks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to call on Mr. Onishi and then. Ms. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, listening to great discussion, and but just to let members know that right now, at the legislature, there's amendments that are, that is being proposed or is in the works in the SB 472, um, SD1, and so right now. Even my staff cannot even get those amendments yet, okay? And some of the amendments that they're looking at is uh, amending the possession by a minor to a petty misdemeanor. Um, adults will not be able to give minors, I guess, marijuana, but which makes sense. But then there isn't, a, like, in the amendment right now, what the penalty is about. Then the other stuff is that minors, if they're found with possession, um, will lose their license, their driver's license, for one year. Okay, but there's other amendments in this bill that's in the legislature right now on the Senate side that they're doing, but it's not online of what all these penalties are. And so, but to me, is like we need to have the public who came out and testified against this resolution that was brought up, but then also about the Senate bill, is we need to contact our legislatures. We need to let them know now that we are against this. And I know yesterday there was a, um, um, what is it, um, a rally, yeah, in Honolulu, and also like I think in Waimea and stuff like that. And I don't know, police force was at the Capitol and talking to Representative uh, Marcus Oshiro about about the, um, uh, what is it, um, uh, you know, 
on how much is an ounce or whatever and they had all these like fake joints and stuff like that but then you know that's where we need to make noise and to me hopefully the papers will print this because we need to get it out now I mean we cannot wait until this this televised like five days later because it's gonna be too late things could happen already so we need to as council members call up our representatives and let them know that we're against this and how it's gonna hurt the, the, the families how it's gonna hurt the children right and and what are we bringing what are we telling the children like because I coach basketball 12 and under girls uh, 10 and under girls and if I do pass this I'm telling them it's okay you know, that's wrong to me that's how I feel so you know I just you know great discussion but we need to just start sending emails out to our legislatures and letting them know that this is that they should kill S, um, SB 472 thank you thank you Mr. Onishi going to wrap it up with Ms. Ford. Okay, I just have one question. I'm asking for a bit of latitude. Doctor, we talked about um, mar using marijuana uh, um, regularly during the, the growing years, 13 to 25, and how the brain circuits in the frontal lobes don't, don't wire themselves together. It triggered a question in my mind because we just had this discussion yesterday with Dr. Fatusik regarding alcohol and drugs and DUIs, you know, and uh, fatalities. When somebody drinks to a, an excess and they always, you know, you hear them say, oh, I'm drunk, but I can drive, you know, and they get out on the road and they kill everybody. Um, when you drink alcohol, does it impair those connections that we hope are there? Is that what's going on in their brain when they, they can't say, I've had too much to drink and I shouldn't be driving, and they get in the car and they drive because they think they can do it? Is it, is it affecting the circuits up here or just, you're off mic. You have to push the little button. Okay. It's right. It's called the GABA. GABA, I mean, it you gas. It's a neurotransmitter that's also in the frontal lobe. You are talking so fast, <laughs> okay. I missed uh, the whole thing. <laughs> okay, the, sorry. There's a neurotransmitter in the frontal lobe called the GABA. GABA, GABA? I mean, GABA. Gas. GABA, right. Alcohol goes straight to the GABA. The GABA controls the part, the, the brakes are put on. That's how, we, that's how we're able to make non-impulsive decisions. Okay. It controls that part of our brain, rationalization part of our brain. Okay. Alcohol goes straight at it, goes straight for it, okay. and it basically shuts it down. See, that's why people, when they drink to excess, they'll keep drinking and, and they start acting real stupid because they've now taken the I, which is the intellect, and the E being emotion, they've reversed them. The intellect is shut down. The GABA is, is interfered with, so therefore they switch it and they become very emotional and they do stupid stuff. Okay, so it is, even if those circuits did make, they grew up enough, the circuits are connected, the GABA is going to be deactivated if you drink to excess, for, for, and then they anybody. start acting. For, for, for uh, adolescents or adult, oh, same the thing. GABA is hit. It, okay. the, the marijuana just goes to the circuit as a developing to stop it from, from rewiring right, correctly. So, for all right. right. Now, I just want to say this again. The marijuana causes the circuits not to connect permanently. Right. Alcohol at any age is right. going to take care, is going to knock out the GABA, G-A-B-A, right. G -A -B -A, right. and that means that they're going to start acting impulsively because the intellect is shut down. Right. Thank you, doctor. Okay. Thank you. Council members, would anyone else like to comment? Okay, so... Miss Willie. Yeah, um, at this time I'd like to withdraw this resolution and appreciate all the discussion and I hope that we're able to continue this on different levels and I think one of the suggestions that's come out that I feel very important and we could do independently, which is what Ms. Ford is talking about and um, what I'm talking about in terms of not lumping marijuana together with heroin and um, uh, ice and other class one um, drugs. So I appreciate it all and I th think that um, we can all individually say what we want to say to the legislature. This is SB 472 SD1 if you look it up and you want to follow it um, uh, on the internet and see what the report's coming out. So Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Council Members, and um, Resolution 81-13 has been withdrawn.